Welcome to the All Central Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Kirk, and I'm joined today by the great theologian, Jonathan Brothero is with us today. That's so right. good. So good to have you. Thank you. So good to have you. And we have again, uh, back with us again, uh, two giants in the faith. Love these guys. Uh, Peter Prothero, also known as P3, Pastor Peter Prothero. <laughs> so good to have you. Thank you. P3 is just so much P3 simpler. P3 is so it? much easier. Yeah. yeah. And in Say Starbucks, that. it's easy too. <laughs> yeah, but just, they do ask you three times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me spell it for you. Yeah. P3. P <laughs> and you can write the word or the number, yeah. whatever you like. Yeah. 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 We, also, we also have uh, Pastor Shane Willard with us, man. So good to have you, a great so friend of the house and, and and of mine and of all 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 three of us here. Um, we just love Pastor Shane being with us. We're going to deep dive into a couple things today, and uh, we have spent the last week together. It's been so much fun. Uh, we went to a baseball game and we took Pastor Peter to that my first to first baseball game ever. <laughs> yeah, how how awesome was it? It was Did brilliant. You, yeah, I loved it. I, I think I even understand it now. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Little little cricket background that you have, you yeah. know, it kind of maybe translates a little bit. Yeah, just we a did rounders yeah. as kids. So, yeah. Okay. So there you similar, go. It is. This is this yeah. is more technical and yeah. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome yeah that's such a good time it was, it was such a great night to be out with you guys and uh, just to hang out um uh life is just so complicated sometimes and complex isn't it and and there's a lot of things that are happening around us and in the world and uh just, but just to take a time just to hang with good friends yeah. you know yeah. and uh, i truly call you guys really good really good friends you know you for know. me after four weeks of ministry it was just time to decompress yeah which is mm. you know yeah really good it's like jesus said come apart and rest a while yeah yeah you exactly. don't come apart and rest you come apart <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Voila. Voila. and he laid it right out there for us didn't he <laughs> oh, wow. and that's the podcast for the day um yeah. <laughs> to come apart and rest you come apart you come apart um we're going to be talking today a little bit about peace and conflict uh peacemaking and conflict and uh and the disposition of peacemaking and conflict that is and uh and so uh the bible talks about blessed are the peacemakers makers and um which you know it's 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 a scripture that you know you read a lot but you really don't ah i just read over it you know yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those those moments when you when you need it you just kind of pull it out and use it in, in a sermon or something uh but there's a lot tied to it when it comes to our life when it comes to conflict resolution all those things that are in our life it's yeah insane. absolutely especially in a context of america where discourse yeah. is just so prevalent in, in any conversation, yeah. whether it's money or politics or <laughs> religious beliefs oh. or <laughs> moral Oof. stances or sexual yeah. ethics, you just go through the list and, and the mm. discourse, the temperature rises yeah. so abruptly and sharply in, in this culture particular. And I think that's mm. fair to say as an Englishman, talk, speaking, having lived here for four years now, it's not much better in England. Yeah. Uh, the discourse is slightly different, but here it's pretty yeah. volatile. It is. And, and so, you know, the scripture that you just... Um, said there comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. this uh, seminal sort of uh, a collection of teachings of Jesus that you could really spend your entire life working through mm -hmm. and then not reading, not needing really to read anything else, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's, it's all there. So that comes from a beatitude and um, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting discussion today because Christianity is so often thought of as a belief system and and not something that we outwork in flesh and blood. And that's yeah. something we repeat and, and, and yeah. you repeat and do it so well, Shane, mm. from the stage. And, yeah. and it's every time you come, I'm reminded it's 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 not just from the neck up. It has to be worked out in, in your hands. Um, but maybe let's unpack this a little bit, because from what I understand, particularly about the Beatitudes, is they're not necessarily conditional statements, um, as in uh, blessed are if you do this. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's, it's, it's or, or I guess I'm muddling my words here, but they're more just statements about what reality is. That, that, that if you become this person, that then you become the child of God. Like a mm. peacemaker is, is going to be known as being a child of God. And, and are you a peacemaker is obviously the question that we have to ask all of ourselves. When mm. you step into a room, do things get calmer? <laughs> 
or do, do things escalate a little bit? When you step into a room, is there a sense of safety? And um, is the conversation I need reasonable? to ask my staff that. <laughs> or maybe maybe you don't that people you don't employ yeah. oh maybe that's it's different is that but that's not different no yeah yeah no, it's not different yeah. you're right and yeah. i know you've got some great thoughts on this shame yeah. well yeah so i think I, the first challenge for me is when you look at how jesus saw the world um which i think you, you made an incredible point like the, the temperature goes up around all these topics that Actually, we should have some dialogue about, but if the outsider looks at how we're having conversations about anything, the Christ that holds us all together should be glorified more than we should be right about our point of view. Mm. And, you know, Christianity, unfortunately, and I think we have a chance to reverse course here, the, the theological word for that would be repentance, mm. is... They've allowed themselves to be defined by things that we shouldn't be known for. And it's not that we shouldn't have an opinion about it or even a conviction about it, but to be known for it is a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. um, Christianity should not be known for their opinions about climate or sex or health or vaxes or masks or uh, politics or uh, Republican or Democrat or labor or liberal or national or, um, and we certainly shouldn't be known for our tendency to be amateur predictors of doom. Um, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Um, like, like, if, yeah. like we should be, our flag in the ground should be our trust in Jesus and our love and, and the manifestation of that trust in Jesus is our love for our yeah. fellow world. Mm. And so it, for, for our fellow man. And so, the way Jesus saw the world is pretty important. The way Jesus saw the world is encapsulated in the Sermon on the Mount. And he just says, look, um, people who have a basic disposition of peacemaking, um, they're going to be one, happier. Um, so the word blessed there is kind of like, it's, there's two words for blessed in Hebrew, um, Baruch, which is God blessing you, mm. or you blessing God. And then Ashri, which is um, kind of like happiness as a result of a basic way of living, right? And and that's the word he's using. And he says, well, you know, you know, people who have a basic disposition in conflict, when people around us are wondering what God is like, that's that's what God is like. And so the challenging is, the challenging part is, is that if I was to hand out a piece of paper to a group of a thousand Christians and say, write down the criteria to be known as a child of God, where would our basic disposition in conflict fall? It wouldn't have made my list till I saw this. Mm. For most people, it's, well, I believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, and I have put my, right? And, and amen, please do all those things. The, the, conf, the confronting part is, is that the first criteria Jesus ever gave for what it, be, what it means to be known as a child of God is our basic disposition conflict. And then 34 verses later in the same sermon, that's just two minutes later, if you're just preaching it, it's two minutes later he repeats himself with different words he says don't just love your friends bless your enemies pray for those who persecute you mm. so that you may be children of your father in heaven so twice in the same sermon he ties our basic disposition and conflict mm. to whether we'll be known as a child of god or not and and so the question that we need to wrestle with is is what is our basic disposition and conflict is there a difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping mm. That's two mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. And did Jesus, if Jesus didn't give two, two things, one, if Jesus didn't give us any strategies for how to live that, mm -hmm. that's kind of just a moral platitude. Mm -hmm. And two, more importantly, did Jesus exhibit the moral authority to say those things? So when Jesus was faced with conflict, did he exhibit a basic disposition of peacemaking specifically to his enemies? Mm. And I think those two things need to be explored. Did Jesus give us any strategies for how to live like that? And when he was faced with a scenario by which he was given a choice to bless his enemies, forgive his enemies, or to hurl down fire from heaven on his enemies, mm. what did he choose to do? Yeah. And in great stress, did he have the moral authority to do that? To, yeah. to, did, did he maintain his moral authority to say what he said by how he lived? 
It's interesting. If you go to Romans 14, you've got Paul who, who says to people, as much as it depends on you, right. live at peace with all men. So, so it's, it is about taking personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. And, and often we can diffuse. Often when the temperature's here, just by our disposition, and, and instead of escalating the conflict, we can de-escalate it. We can actually bring the temperature down. And, you know, it's something I've had to learn over many, many years. Um, letting go of the need to be right. Mm. Letting go of the need to win right. in an argument. Mm. And rather just say, what, will, what could I say now that will further us actually connecting as people. And so Jesus prays in John 17, you know, he prays that they might be one, that the world might know. So it's a, it's a sort of a unity prayer. And then you've got Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, you know, and it's that lovely word, yachad, yachad, repeated for emphasis, when they dwell together, together. And, uh, 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 and being intentional about making sure our relationships function at that level you know that's a challenge because i have to check my heart i have to check my attitude i have to actually begin by believing the best about this person not picking up on one thing that they said right and then suddenly defining them by that correct Mm. and i like that what you said there's two words that stuck out to me um is responsibility and intention so as far as it depends on you the tendency, it's very easy to go, hey, the lack of peace in this situation mm. is their fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and maybe, but mm. if that's our starting point, um, we sabotage the opportunity to be at peace. And you see this all the time. That obvious example is marriage. Like if a marriage is starting to spiral into some chaotic cycle of conflict, very rarely do you see somebody show up and going, okay, before we hash this out, this was my fault. And more often than not, it's, <laughs> if you knew what she, like, if you knew how she, if you knew how he, so there's personal responsibility, but then there's intention. Uh, there's a story I, I, I like to tell about intention around peacemaking. So um, the first time I went to Israel, um, Pastor Terry had organized us with this top, top guy. And um, Terry and, uh, Pastor Terry and somebody else was over there and, and um, the top guy, had, he had said something, um, it was just kind of me and him, and he mm-hmm. had said something that blew my mind, right? Like, I was amazed. Uh, but the way I expressed my amazement confused him, because I was like, I went, really? Really? <laughs> well, so, so he thought you were being aggressive. <laughs> correct. Or yeah. disagreeing. Yes, yeah. He, yeah. he thought, oh man, right? Now, let me be clear, I was amazed, and um, I would not want to, we're standing in Jerusalem with a Jerusalem history expert speaking about Jerusalem history. <laughs> are you with him? <laughs> He's forgotten more than I have. You were just blown away. Yeah, yeah. And yes, and let me be yeah. clear, if, if they're turned into an argument, he has all the bullets. <laughs> and, but what's, what's, what's important is, is that he thought I was being antagonistic, and his almost immediate response was, Shame. Peace between us is the most important thing. If one of us needs to be wrong, oh man, please let it be me. <laughs> right? And I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. Which I was confused, which made it worse. Sure. Right? So I went, what? Like you wanted to come back at him, like, like what? what? <laughs> like, yes. And then yeah. he goes, oh, shame. Oh, wow. If the world sees us in conversation, May Christ be glorified. Would you oh. let Would you let me be right? Would you let me be wrong so that they can see Christ in our conversation? Mm-hmm. Right. And now look, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's a child of God. Yeah. Right. And um. And I thought to myself. So I said. I said. Did you want? Did you think I wanted to argue with you? And he said, Didn't you? And so I said, Look, first of all, I'm so sorry. My tone was excitable. And then as smart as I can be sometime with words, I couldn't think of anything but metaphors. I said the exact metaphor you said. I said, I was blown away. We're in Jerusalem. Like, like, who was blowing away? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and so, and so I, I said, no, no, I, I, I was amazed. And, that's what, and he said, oh, were you amazed? I said, yes. And he said, oh, good. 
Oh, good. Oh, dear. Because I knew I was right about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what? <laughs> but he said, funny, but he said, but, but seriously. How gracious. How gracious. Great and yeah. humble. Oh, yeah. my God. Do you have to be to know you are in the right 1,000%? Yeah. And honor peace first. But to go, our peace is more important than yeah. me convincing you that I'm do, right. This is great moment. marriage advice that, too, by the yeah. way. Do you think that's what Paul is getting at in Ephesians <laughs> 4, where he talks yeah. about, you know, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, you know, and he says, bear with one another, you know, be long suffering, and then and then endeavoring to preserve the unity mm -hmm. in spirit in the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. You think? I think so. I think the, the more I see this, the 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 more I, the more I see it, the more I see it, which is. Paul's letters, an inordinate amount of time is spent trying to inspire people by the Jesus event of the cross and resurrection to say, don't just believe in it. Mm. Allow that to form how you treat Gentiles mm. and Gentiles, how you treat Jews, thus making one new, one new man. Yeah, and a, a, like an, yeah. an, an inordinate, like just remembering that the book of Romans, for instance, or Ephesians or any of them, we're not meant to be read as individuals in your room alone in your private time, but as a community sermon, normally mm -hmm. read by some appointed reader. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. and and you know, just to not to nerd out here, but um, in 50 A.D., Claudius uh, expelled all the Jews from Rome. I can't, I can't cope with the conflict that um, in history he exp he expelled them because of a conflict around somebody called Christos. Okay. And then five years later realized we need them here because they're tanners and shoemakers and da 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 da, da. Industrious. And he, it was, it was destroyed. It was being detrimental to the economy. So he invites them back. And in that meantime, all these Gentiles had said yes to Jesus, but to say yes to Jesus, they had to, they had to kind of borrow the Jewish story and the Jews come back and like, you stole our stories, right? <laughs> and um, and then and, and the one thing they had in common was they were both being oppressed by the upper class of Rome, and then but then they got into conflict about this sounds so familiar. They allowed things that mattered less mm. to become the main thing. Mm. So they started arguing about well, when we get together for meals, who's in charge of the menu? They put bacon in the pasta, right? Right, like we don't do that. And then, and so Paul's having to write some pretty basic stuff like, hey, if you're free to eat something, but they're not the humbler person who yes. honors peace, yeah. That's um, right. actually, even though you're freer, yeah. the freer person, the more mature person becomes the humbler person. Yeah. It makes and, the greatest sacrifice. Correct. And so in my experience, like mm. around, the, around the world, like, there might be a few exceptions to this, but the real scholars... The person who, the people who actually have the knowledge are never the ones lording it over you. Mm. The loudest screamers and all that, they don't really, they're, they're having to compensate for their, but the, the guy in Jerusalem who knew all everything, but he chose, and this is where I was going with responsibility, he took the responsibility. Mm. And I think we could all kind of agree that anybody that responds like that, when they think someone's taken them on, they decided early in the morning, anyone, who comes after me today mm. in a way like that, I'm gonna respond like this. He didn't do that just naturally in yeah. the moment. He chose before the day started to be intentional and responsible about peacemaking. Man. That's, that's amazing. And I think it's really, yeah, peacemaking mm. is is the key thing here because you know you quoted Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is yeah. when God people dwell together in unity that idea of being together, together. But I know lots of groups that meet together and are in unity, but they meet around their dysfunction or they meet around their whatever it is. Um, but to meet together in in peacemaking and to, to be agreed, mm -hmm. like you say, it's a premeditated thought that I'm going to agree not to enter into this form of conflict. But, but I will say this, and I can imagine somebody writing this in the comments, what about Jesus when he makes a whip and he stands for what he mm -hmm. believes and he defends God, defends the temple, and, he, and it seems to be a pretty aggressive act or antagonistic, you know, 
where's the space for that type of conflict and and when is that allowed and when is that not allowed and what's going on in Jesus's mind here maybe can we just talk about that because it seems that at moments Jesus does enter into pretty severe conflict sure well there's this great book out everybody needs to read it's called the soft and hard side of leadership <laughs> um, and, and, it's a shameless plug for P3's book it's, 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 but but that is but a one, good one you know yeah. whenever Jesus sees hypocrisy it, it, it He's aggressive in, in the sense of it's such a misrepresentation of both who he is and, and the kingdom. Mm. And, and whenever God is misrepresented, you know, Jesus, when I say hard, I don't mean unfeeling. You know, the hard side of leadership is not an unfeeling, uncaring mm. side. Mm. It's simply clear about what the real issue is. Mm. And I think I think Jesus has a vision of the temple and what it's there for and where the money changes were was, was the only place Gentiles could come in and worship God. It was the only place. So, it, so the religious leaders had created a, a place of exclusion in, instead of a place of inclusion. And, and Jesus, he, he just empties it all out. Yeah. He empties it all out. And I think, I think it's like, that is a specific instance where people were selling something God was offering for free. Mm -hmm. And I think to understand it fully, not fully, but another element of it is to understand ancient prophetic homiletical models. So, so for us, preaching is, okay, I've come up with these four points and this thing and this outline. And sometimes ancient prophets preach like that. Sometimes they preach with like, I don't know what to call it, but guerrilla theater. Mm. So Jesus is in that tradition. So like Ezekiel preaches a sermon one time where he lays naked for 140 days. Um, he cooks food with poop. That was his sermon. So he, he makes this stir fry and mixes poop with it. And, mm. and you, you, people might be thinking, what would be the point of that sermon? Well, his point was, was that Israel, you look nice from a distance, but the closer you get there, so, like you're a chocolate covered turd and like, like <laughs> yeah. you look clean, but actually there's something un mm. not nice yeah. underneath it. Mm. Hosea marries prostitute, a prostitute and keeps married. Like, so Jesus curses a fig tree one time as his sermon. So he, he curses this fig tree cause it bore no fruit. It only had leaves. And then it says something weird. It says, and everybody heard what he was trying to say, which it's like, well, what was he trying? Like that's a, and so to clean out the money changers, I, I don't think it was this act of a temper tantrum as much as it was mm. a sermon around around forgiveness being free. Yeah. Um, and and to, to pivot back to the Sermon on the Mount, this is an entirely different location. Um, the Galilean region uh, where they were occupied by a foreign military. So when he later says, be able to pray and bless your enemies, he's talking about an occupying military force. Um, and how to live at peace when the oppressors have all the power. Mm. And he, man, and he gives this genius advice, actually. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous for me to say Jesus gave this genius advice, but when you look at it, it was kind of like, mm. um, and very confronting. So he says, um, don't just love your friends, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Um, but three verses before that, he gives this like, like a homiletical thing where three points mm. and it, and it's, and it's really confronting. Like if we just stopped at the end of each of these three points and said, how are we doing with that? Like he says, um, turn the other cheek. Someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one. Mm. Um, give your tunic and your cloak. Someone wants your outer cloak. Just give me your inner cloak, like get naked. Mm. Um, oh, and, uh, if someone asks you to, if someone, it doesn't say ask, it says if someone forces you to go one mile, you, yeah. yeah, go two. And then the next verse, don't just love your friends, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven, tying it back to peacemaking. And so, um, like if I just use one of those, uh, if someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one. How are we doing with that? Hmm. Like, to be blunt, we can't even be nice to a news anchor that happens to anchor the news on a station we don't prefer. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Much less the sergeant of a military force who's telling, oh, yeah, go ahead and rape those women in that village. It's like, mm. this is too, too like, yeah. a lack of perspective is the enemy of hope. This is where Christians go, this is the worst time ever to be alive. Man, if, <laughs> if we woke up right now, just 
instantly in first century Galilee. We'd be we'd throw up in ten seconds and we'd be dead in three days, probably. Yeah, yeah. First of all, we think it was a democracy. We'd be raising our voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's just um it's it's just crazy town so i'd like to actually we could, i want to bounce some of this off pete because i find pete's insight on this but i find pete's insight on anything really profound but when he when he says if someone slaps you on your right cheek turn the other cheek this was a first century racial slur times 10 like with violence um because in the roman empire there was a nine layered class system and so if Pete and I were both class two people, we had a problem, we'd hit each other with our right hands. Mm -hmm. But if he's class eight, I'm class two. Not hitting him with my right hand. Mm -hmm. It's not worth that, hitting him with my left. Because yeah. it's the hand I wipe my bum with. Mm -hmm. It was essentially, you're not worth my clean hand, I'm gonna hit you with my poo-poo hand. And, and so it was a way of calling someone less human, yeah. but with a violent act instead of a word. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so Jesus says, look, if someone slaps you on your right cheek, well, if slaps someone on the right cheek, uh, uh, yeah. you, you're living in your left hand. Doing that, yeah, yeah. You're, you're going, boom. He says, oh, turn the other cheek, which is not an act of just straight passivity. Right. It's an act of intentional, nonviolent boundary drawing, which is mm -hmm. if we're gonna have conflict, step one, you're gonna address me as an equal. As an equal, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I think that's brilliant. And, and, and so that's our starting point. You know, the Sermon on the Mount has so much in it that allows us to be missional as a church. Because, you know, later on, he goes on, he says, if somebody compels you to go one mile, go two. Well, it was only the Roman army that could compel you to go a mile. But mm. just think about it. So you're with this soldier. He's forced you to walk a mile. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long a mile takes to walk, but, you know, let's say 10 minutes, I don't know, 15. Mm -hmm. um, you, you do this 15 minute walk, and the guy turns around and he says, okay, you're off the hook now. And you go, no, it's okay, I'd like to do another mile. Well, what's, what's that conversation gonna be like in the next 15 minutes? You know, that soldier's gonna be there and he's going, what is it about you? Why would you even think to do that for someone like me? We're here, mm. we're occupying mm -hmm. you. Mm. And he says, you really wanna know? Well, there's this guy who had a profound impact on my life and change the way I see the world, change the way I see you, change the way I see me, and change the way I see my context. Mm. And, and suddenly, what, what was simply legal and allowed and everyday experiences, suddenly becomes a missional opportunity. Yeah. Mm. I can actually talk about Jesus because I'm, I'm doing this voluntarily now, unless he tells me to shut up, which is unlikely, because I've piqued his interest. Right. And so with you know, your generosity exactly right mm. exactly so that whole thing for me you know the sermon on the mount it your generosity of spirit your willingness to uh, be a peacemaker it creates opportunities to speak Cor oh, correct because it's mm. because it's mm. unusual yeah mm. yeah it goes a, a layer deep as well because i they would get in trouble for forcing them to go further than a mile because people needed to get back. So there was there was this idea around, you know, your oppressor running after you because of your generosity. Yeah. yeah. So he's, I'm going to chase you. No, 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 don't go any further. Yes. Like, I'm going to get in trouble here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, I'm just being generous. Stop me. <laughs> you know, and so there was a very practical application, mm -hmm. like your Uber, the way to confront greed and oppression is not with hostility. It's with Uber generosity. Yeah. And the Uber generosity actually confronts the oppressive nature of the heart of the other person, mm -hmm. which to Pete's point, then brings an opportunity for conversation that isn't going to be had otherwise. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, otherwise it's just a bunch of a bunch of punch ups because because yeah. yeah, the Roman soldiers were class two, galleon peasants were largely class eight. Well, if you got a seventy pound, thirty two kilogram pack, mm -hmm. you're not carrying it for your walk. Yeah, you're yeah. surrounded by these low lives. Yeah, you're and, gonna carry it. And the lowest, by the way, was the foot washer. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So it just makes John 13 even more profound. Mm. You know, Jesus is washing feet. You know, everyone walks in the room and sees it, and there's no foot washer there. It's like, well, yeah, it's not my. I'm better than that. Mm. Yeah. And then Jesus takes that on him, and it's yeah, yeah. You know, all brilliant. of this is. And this is, this is why I, I, I try to, in my speaking, I try to really pound this home that in general, it's not never, but in general, people don't reject Jesus. 
they reject a certain image of Jesus presented to yeah. them. Yeah. And like I, the prayer I'm getting people to pray every time I speak now is, Lord Jesus, may no one ever reject you because of how I'm presenting you. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you take that image of Jesus, the foot washing, yeah. turning the other cheek, mm. go the extra mile, give your tunic and your cloak Jesus. I've never met anybody that, if they said, if they said, what, what was Jesus's way of seeing the world? And you're like, okay, so check this out, right? If I don't know anybody personally who would go, yeah, I think if the whole world converted to that way of thinking, the world would be worse. Yeah. I, I, I just don't. So if they're rejecting Jesus, there's something about the image. So you take the foot washing, turning the other cheek, Jesus, but then you present him as a, a person of violence, mm who lashes out at his enemies. I mean, the guy that allowed and surrendered to his enemies to murder him, and even in that, forgave him. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, the, that's the guy with the moral authority yeah. to say these certain things here. Yeah. What about a situation um, where two people are in conflict? You know, you've got the famous example in Acts mm -hmm. 15 with Paul and Barnabas. Uh, where at least in, in the immediate situation, they didn't resolve the difference of opinion. The one thing I think that's highly redemptive about that whole account is, is the mission of God was not affected. They created two teams instead of one. Mm -hmm. um, is that what John Mark, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, John yeah Mark, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't descend into, yeah. uh, you know, into violence, yeah. into, uh, I'm never speaking to you again. It right. is, okay, let's find a redemptive way out of mm -hmm. this. So. That, to mature men, they seem to do that. But then you've got Philippians 4, and I, excuse if anyone's a Greek scholar here, excuse my pronunciation, Yodia and Syntyche. Uh, and Paul, I feel like almost the whole book is, is to help these two women reconcile. And then he says, you true companion, I think the Greek is Zuzagos. But anyway, they needed a third person to come in. I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk about that and, and, and experiences anyone's ever had about how you've been the mediator or the peacemaker for others who've come in. Mm. There's a fascinating movie um, uh, called Oslo, which is a movie about the, the first peace accord. Um, and it was how, to, how they got the Israelis and the, and the Palestinians together in a room because the Israeli government at that time uh, I think it was under Ben-Gurion, they had made a statement that there will be no dialogue with terrorists, you know, until there had been an acknowledgement. So there, w there were these intractable positions. So the Oslo Accord that came out of this, the Oslo Agreement, were basically two people from Norway, not very high up in the diplomatic thing, but they, they managed to get together a professor from Israel, a professor of economics, and somebody who was like a deputy to Yasser Arafat at the time, to bring them to Norway, and they had two rooms. And it's fascinating as peacemakers how they structured this. They said, in this room, we don't talk about anything we disagree on. We talk about family, we talk about our life, we talk about who we are, what our aspirations are, what our dreams might be. In this room over here, we talk about the issues that we don't agree on. But and we debate and we argue, but then we break off and we come back into this room. And the, ho the whole program was fascinating to me how they were facilitating some level of connection and reconciliation. And, um, and the movie, you know, when they finally get these two guys together, you know, the Jew looks at the Palestinian, he said, I've never met a Palestinian in my life. Mm -hmm. And the Palestinian says, well, I've met plenty of you guys. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, then, but then they talk about, you know, they talk about their family and they talk about their children. Mm. They talk about, and it's like suddenly you, you instead of them being demonized, mm -hmm. suddenly you've actually got two human beings talking. Um, and, and it made, it facilitated something else happening in the areas of disagreement. And out of it actually came what was known as the, Oslo Accord. But, but I'd love to know anyone else's experience about how you've been a facilitator to bring peace where people are sort of intractable or they're stuck or they say, help us. Right. Well, I mean, so because I 
practiced as a counseling psychologist for a little while. That was kind of, um, sometimes, sometimes my clients were one-on-one. Sometimes it was, Hey, can you help us sort this out? And there's some, you know, there's quite some, actually some com- comedy that comes out of some of the people's <laughs> points of just trying to get people, Hey, can you breathe for a second and repeat? Can, could you, in your own words, tell me that person's point of view? And just that kind of right. like, oh, wait, wait. cause what happens, I think the key word you use there is, um, with the Oslo Accord is, is when you put someone in a room and you're only allowed to talk about what you, unif- what, what, where you have in common, you humanize them instead of scapegoating the entire race as an ideology that mm-hmm. in your mind would be destructive. Mm-hmm. And then you, you start demonizing the person instead of the idea, and there's there's a whole trouble with that. But I I think it's an interesting insight I've never had before in my life on Philippians being an entire book about helping a fledgling community that's fixing maybe to be dis into disrepair and disunity because of these two ladies who can't get their stuff together. Yeah. Um. And and that so I've always not always but when I've when I've thought about blessed are the peacemakers, I've thought about it individually. Like, um, what's my disposition? But I think you're bringing another aspect yeah. to the table, which is, hey, do we have do we bear any responsibility to when I see these two in un unredeemable conflict? Do I can I bring a redemption story to it and help them yes, come exactly. together? Well, there's a well, and and frankly, there's an entire career path that's quite lucrative you know, arbitrators yeah. Um, yeah. that just help people sort that out. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. as pastors, we've done it probably countless times. It's just, yeah. yeah. Without even like knowing we're, you know, that that's what we're doing. We're yeah. doing it. And, you know, it's you just know, a part of the Philippines chapter one says, you know, Paul says some preach Christ out of envy mm-hmm. and strife seeking to add affliction. Some, some out of sincerely, he says, I don't care. Christ is preached which I find unbelievable in the sense of what he's prepared to let go. Right. Mm. Like, 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 first of all, I'm shocked that people preach with agendas. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like in my, well, I'm not shocked now because I'm in my 60s, but, but yeah, when I was yeah. in my 20s, it was hard to swallow that. Yeah. It was really hard to swallow it. And then in life, you see it. And yeah. you see people who are just very, very gifted on stage, and then you watch them behave, and you just think, "Oh my goodness, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Something else is at play." Mm-hmm. Um, I remember somebody saying to me once, "Peter, be very, very careful. Your gift does not take you where your character cannot keep you." And and I I think we're obsessed with with gifting on people's mm-hmm. lives and everything, mm-hmm. which we need, but but you need the character to sustain that. But Paul's prepared to let that go and just say, "I'm going to rejoice." Yeah, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, Paul holds a lot of things lightly. Ah, oh, I come to know only a few things. Christ crucified, <laughs> like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I, 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 we don't fully agree on this, but you know, the end of Romans, I always felt like he comes up with this doxology, like he just kind of, this is all this theology and here and there and there, and he just comes to the who can know <laughs> at the end of the day, like I, I don't even know, but he's clear on what he does know as well. You know, look at Galatians and you know he's talking about the apostles. Yeah, I met the apostles. They added nothing to my ministry. Like, oh, yeah. like they, yeah, they didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. There's no problem putting that in a letter. Yeah. But, but what you're getting at here, and, and worth read if you're watching this, obviously, is, is Matthew 18 and, and yeah. going through that process of sometimes, for whatever reason, sometimes conflict is just unresolvable between the two of you. Right. Because of ego, pride, it can be a million mm-hmm. whatever scenarios. Maybe there's just too much baggage and to have an arbitrator or a peacemaker. Mm. But the goal in every step of Matthew 18, whether it's one-on-one with your brother, or, or whether it's bringing somebody or, or an eldership team or, or a group of wise people into the mix, the goal at every level is always mm. peacemaking mm. Right. Or, or reconciliation, not to be. Yeah, right. I think I think God uses that. And when we're, you know, in marriage, mm-hmm. how do we do with that? Yeah. You know, that's a challenge <laughs> in and of itself, isn't it? <laughs> sure. Like it's, you know, how, OK, you, you can do it out here. But what about right here in your own personal life? Like yeah. the, the, the person you're responsible for that God's 
gave you a gift in your life and, and how do, how do you work? You know, how do you do that? Yeah. How are you doing with that? Well, I, I remember know? one time in, in my marriage where my wife said, I just can't talk to you about this. We need counseling. You know, and I was so scared to death. Yeah. I was like, well, look, let, let's talk about it again. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I'll try to be more reasonable. Yeah. 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 I don't want a counselor knowing I'm a, yeah. you know, I'm a jerk in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like God gives you a practice rounds with your marriage <laughs> yes. so you can do it in the world. You know, this is your practice right here. We're yeah. going to practice peacemaking yeah. in this so that you can take that out to the but world. Jesus made some yeah. assumptions that are quite confronting. Like he assumed that his followers would talk yeah, and then which just I mean that sounds real simple but just think about that yeah. he assumed that fully <laughs> devoted followers of Jesus who try to see the world how he sees it see God how he sees God mm. and apply scripture but they wouldn't find themselves not talking so mm -hmm. he assumes they're willing to talk and then he assumes something that is really confronting that when it comes to a redemptive talk that each person assumes that they have the plank <laughs> and the other person has the spec, yeah. which just pause for a second. Think, mm. think about that assumption. Like, like I'd, I, I'd love to talk to Jesus about how he, how he saw the world and, and go, you, that is a brave assumption that, and is a, not just a brave assumption, that is a radical assumption that the spirit of Christ can do such a transforming work in someone's heart mm. that in conflict, I can assume that I have the bigger problem and you have the much smaller problem. Mm. And so before I engage in spec removal, mm. I'm gonna engage in plank removal. Mm. That is a confronting assumption. Mm. It, it is, and, and then Paul picks, I think he picks up on that in 1 Corinthians 6, where he talks about the believers there going to court with one another mm. and he said and he's shot and that before unbelievers you know he said and he gives a couple of is there not a wise man among you you know which is the peacemaker mm. and then he says why don't you let yourself be wronged and it's like oh my goodness mm. you know this is the the letting go of the cloak you know yes this is the you know Okay, you know, for peace, like your your peace Jewish with, friend in mm. Jerusalem. Oh yeah, let us be known for peace among us. Okay, mm. if an outsider sees our conversation, yeah, may the Christ that holds us all together be glorified mm. yeah. more than I need to be right about my position in a court of. And yeah. Paul takes it further and goes, yeah. "You're airing all of your conflict in front of people who are wondering about Christ." Yes, like. Think about the weightier matter here. Mm. I mean, yeah, man, it's yeah. so difficult in a culture that's so where self autonomy is paramount, mm. and so we don't tend to think in terms of community or mm -hmm. people. It's it's me. It's me. It's my yeah. rights. Mm. It's mm. it's how I feel. My emotions, yeah. and and so, you know. When you place yourself at the center of any world, it's always going to become difficult and confronting <laughs> when you're asked to make peace with all those yeah. around you. What comes down to theology too, like my personal Lord and Savior. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus died yeah. for oh, well, what me. About? Or the song, <laughs> he took the fall <laughs> and thought of me. <laughs> thought of me. <laughs> above, above all. Above, above all. Above everybody you, else. How do you even <laughs> sing that song? <laughs> in a, I mean, how do you even sing that song in a you group of people? You just that for me right <laughs> now. <laughs> well, imagine, imagine having some big conference at the O2 in London. Yeah. And there's 7,000 people. He took the fall. Yeah. <laughs> Thought of me <laughs> more than you. <laughs> it's, it's, I, mean, I can see you singing that song in a private devotion. Yeah. But, but like, but like my, per, my personal Lord and Savior. And look, let me be clear. I want each person to make a consent and participate with the work of Christ in your life individually. Mm. But... In scripture, you almost never see that. It's it's almost you in your house. Mm, yeah. You brought this to your community, yeah. um, and 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 when we when we personalize God, let me be clear. I think we need to do that. Mm. However, when we only see it that way, mm -hmm. um, and and then it absolves us of our responsibility to our brother. Mm. Uh, at very least, it paints a horrendous yeah. picture to people wondering what we're about. Yeah. And it's like when people um, say things like, 
what's God, God's plan for my life? And I think I wrote this in my book. I, I said the problem with that statement is it's three words too long. Yes. B yeah. Because you don't start with what is God's plan for my life because that puts me in the center and God orbits. Mm. It, it's like, what is God's plan? What is he up to? How do I bring my life into alignment now mm. with what he's doing? Yeah, mm. that's good. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's central. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, seek ye first the kingdom. It always made me smile when I saw discipleship manuals and number six was seek ye first the kingdom. <laughs> was, number six. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, it, yeah. First you have to you know, receive Jesus and then you have to be baptized and you have to be filled with the spirit and then you have to do this. And then seek you first the kingdom. It's like, mm. Mm, no, no. Yeah. Uh -oh. And I, I, you'll have to help me. You'll have to help me with the reference on this, but what comes to my mind when people ask like, what's God's personal will for me or whatever is, and it's, it's a Paul letter. I think that he says, um, give thanks, uh, rejoice, and I think pray, give thanks, rejoice, and pray for this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus and, concerning you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I and so. it's, it's and, and so, and I, I think what happens is because we individualize everything, um, so do I want to be a nurse or an accountant, right? Well, that's, that's not really the question. The question is, do you like to help hurting people or do you like analytics and numbers? And then, <laughs> and then, and then, and then, and then choose one and then give thanks, rejoice, and yeah. pray, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, do I marry this person or that person? <laughs> choose one and then depending on the quality of your choice, will determine how much you give thanks, <laughs> rejoice. And, and, and how much peacemaking and, you have and to do. And how much prayer, <laughs> right? And, and so I, like, like if, we, if, if, if we simplify it like Paul did, which is, you know, hey, um, God is less interested in the specific decision as much as he is in all things that you give thanks, rejoice, mm. and pray, um, we can create a picture of a community that I think people would be asking to get in. I love, I, I, I read a history book in the last year called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church by Alan Creeder. He's a historian. He got interested in how did the church grow in the first 300 years? He only examined it to the baptism of Constantine and then the book ends. Because after that, it's obvious how it grew. Mm. But he said, how did the church grow when it was illegal and people were getting killed? And and it's it's a long book, so it's it's a it's a patient ferment to read the book. But I powered through it, and it was it was really good. And he he his point was, it actually came down to five things, that were all about what he called habitus or living like Christ mm. more than it was. And he made a point that's so obvious, but it might not be obvious to. It was obvious after he said it, which is. The Church of Jesus Christ for the first 323 years was not known for what they believed. They were known for how they lived because the creeds weren't there, the scriptures weren't put together. They, mm. you know, yeah. and and he said it was really come down to five things. One, that Christian Christianity in the Roman Empire um, was a private society, not a public religion, and it was the only private society that welcomed women. So when you're the only society welcoming half the population, you're going to grow. Second, no membership fee. The rich paid the way for the poor, right? Third, they ate together. First class, eighth class, eating at the same table. Mm -hmm. and fourth, I didn't never knew what this was. I was just glad we didn't do it. When it says, greet each other with a holy kiss, I never knew what that was. I was just so glad we've abandoned that tradition. Well, well here's the thing about the holy kiss, Get is sweet. if you've got a grade two person who meets another grade two and their slave is with them, mm. who's, who's say grade six or eight. Eight, yeah. And you greet this person with a kiss, mm -hmm. and then you greet this one with a kiss as well, publicly. Yes. You know, the holy kiss was Paul's subversive way of creating equality. Yes, exactly, Creator's point. Yeah. Well, he said it was so critical because it was a way of demonstrating our belief around one God holding the whole thing together. Yes. It's not just a belief. We're actually willing to not just touch, but we're the the upper class people would kiss the lower class people mm -hmm. in public to demonstrate one Christ holding the whole thing together, mm. um, and that would create conversation. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, me mate! The last thing, and this was this is really critical to to point out. The book was written in 2016, so COVID hadn't happened. 
Um, so it wasn't even a subliminal response to COVID. He said the church grew because of response to pandemics. And he talked about the smallpox pandemic of 251 in Carthage and how when you got to the end of medical knowledge, um, you would go see the oracle. The oracle were these kind of people who lived in caves and were thought to have a connection with the gods. And um, the pagan oracle of Carthage said, gave a four-point sermon. You've offended God. You've got to afflict yourself to get right with God or the end times are coming upon you. That was the pagan oracle sermon. The Christian bishop was a guy named Cyprian, and Cyprian's four-point sermon was, Christians don't ask why, they express how. We will not be involved in any controversy or quarrel about the law, like a quote from Titus 3, right? So he must have been some kind of familiar with Paul's letter there. Um, we, will, we will build hospitals and centers of supply for the poor and the afflicted, and we will be known for doing good in our world. Mm. And so, you know, did the Pentecostal response in the COVID pandemic sound more like a pagan oracle or a Christian bishop? And, and I started thinking about like peacemaking, as far as it depends on you, intentionality, responsibility, showing a community, God being at the center, not God orbiting our thing, all the things that we've just brought up here mm -hmm. and thought, man, you know, we have an opportunity individually and collectively to show to show how Jesus saw the world and to show that if the whole world converted to that way of thinking, the world would be a better place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's around, forgiveness is not around behavior, but effectiveness sure is. Mm -hmm. And showing the image of God to our world sure is. And, and being known as a child of God in our world, I mean, probably don't even need to get into the complexities of 10 other things as much as before we just master the first one, our basic disposition. Yeah. Mm. Let, what Paul, what you brought up, I hadn't thought of like, would you not just let yourself be wronged for this yeah. Christ? Like I did, yeah. Jesus did. Yes. Like, don't just believe in that, be inspired by it yeah. to live a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and put your faith in a God of justice who makes it all right at the end anyway. Right, yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, I think it showed a lot in the um, pandemic about peacemaking, about that disposition um, when it came to the world and how we how we handled it mm -hmm. with with others, Larry. When it came and, to toilet paper, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, toilet paper. Whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed, mm -hmm. whether it's the, it, I mean, there was so much so much conflict around it, so much polarization, polarization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just going out to the yeah. extremes. And and I think the biggest question is how did we handle that as a church? Yeah. You know, in that. Did, did we show the world what God looked like or did we fail miserably at it? You know, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It definitely highlighted a lot of people's hearts for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we're definitely wrapping up on yeah, our time a, a little bit here, but maybe like a, a final thought or even a challenge. We don't often do this is mm -hmm. what would it look like this week if you allowed yourself to be wronged? And, and just to sit there for a second at Starbucks when they're taking 10 minutes to order your coffee or, or the person who cuts you up just to go, do you know what? I'm just going to be, I'm going to let the shalom of God just, just full, full embodied me right now. Just, just rest yeah. upon me, yeah. the peace of God. And so I hope that was just such a great conversation. What Thanks, a guys. needed one. Thanks guys for that. It was incredible. Yeah. It was powerful. And we just hope that today that this enriched your life.